And so open up to Romans uh, chapter 3 this morning. If you have your Bibles or your phone, I'll have some of the verses on the screen uh, as well. And we're looking at verses 9 to 20. And, and basically this morning I want to answer this question. Uh, if How do you come to know God? How do you come to know God? It's a really simple question, um, you know, it's, but it's a very important question. How do you come to know God? And the answer is that actually the way to know God is wide open. The path to know God is actually wide open. In Matthew 7, verse 13 to 14, it says this. It says the first word is this, enter, enter. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And so the point is that though the gate is small and the road is narrow, the way to God is open, but only a few find it. Only a few enter. And so how do you come to know God? Well, it's easy. All you need is need. And all you must have is nothing. And that's as easy as you can get, right? All you need is need. And all you must have is nothing. But the truth is, most people don't have it. All you need is need. All you must have is nothing. But the problem is, most people don't have it. You see, to have need and nothing is much harder than you think. And this morning, this text, Romans 3, verse 9 to 20, it tells us why. All you need is need. What's so hard about that? Well, I, um, as I said before, I spent some time living in Lynchburg, Virginia. And uh, when I arrived, one of the first questions that I had for the people there is, where is the best coffee in town? And the people pointed me to the sign And uh, you can't quite see it on this sign. I couldn't find a picture of it. But there were signs around the place that said, Joe Beans, the best coffee in the Berg. Now, how many of you would trust a sign like that? I have come to learn that if you see a bright kind of coloured sign that says the best coffee in town, beware, it's a trap. (laughs) It's it's not really. Um, Because actually, you know, just because they had the sign, it doesn't mean that they were the best coffee in town. In fact, there was a bunch of other places that were far better than this place. But the problem, of course, with the Joe Bean sign is that it's a self-assessment. It's a self-assessment. And the reason it's so hard to come to God with need is because it requires having an accurate view of yourself. Having an accurate view of yourself, and that's hard. It's much harder than you think. Well, look there in verse 9. Paul gives an accurate self-assessment. He says, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. Now, the context is provided, and we saw it last week. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. And this here, Paul is kind of summarizing the argument to now. And the argument is this. Uh, or the whole issue at Rome is this, that there's two people groups, they're different backgrounds. You have the Jews who have a long history with God, they've had the word of God, they have a long history with God, and then you have the Gentiles who have no history with God. And they're trying to make it work in one church. They're trying to make it kind of come together with the ideas on how God should be worshipped together in one church. Each have their backstories. You have the Greeks who were the rebels, who were described as the, the great sinners of, of all throughout history. And then you have the Jews who were the religious. But as we saw last week, Paul charged the religious with the same sentence as the Jews, didn't he? He said, you practice the same things. You are also, uh, you are equally in the same boat as the Gentiles. And so he concludes there at the end of verse 9, both Jews and Greeks are under sin. That's Paul's accurate self-assessment. We are all under sin. But he addresses it specifically to the Jews because he knows that their biggest problem is their view of themselves. Their view of themselves. 
It's much harder than you think to have an accurate self-assessment. Why? It's because of our pride. We humans have this problem called pride. Just this week, I arrived at our Tuesday morning staff meeting 15 minutes late. And upon arrival, I loudly announced to all my staff all the reasons I was late. The bad traffic, 50 minutes it took me. I detailed every reason, the Adelaide 500, the fringe, the train, Adelaide's never-ending roadworks. And of course, the glaring hole in my argument and excuse was that all my staff had the same barriers that I had that morning, and they managed to arrive at the staff meeting on time. And so, the tendency of the human heart is to pridefully conclude it wasn't my fault. I'm not that bad. We have a tendency to have one of three dispositions in life that are all rooted in pride. The first one is this, I am far better than most people and no one really likes this person. You know, you kind of look at this person and, you know, they, they think that they're better. And the thing, the reason that they have pride is because they don't need any help. They're already perfect. They already do everything the way it should be done. I'm far better than most people. And then you have the other extreme, which is that I'm far worse than most people. And these people are also too proud for help. You know, they're beyond help. I'm so bad and they're so inwardly focused, so self-obsessed that they actually believe that they are beyond help. No one can help me. I'm far worse than everybody else. And so most of us put ourselves in this position that I am somewhere in the middle. You see, I'm not like those people who are like think they're really good and I don't think I'm the worst person ever. I'm right where I should be. And that person is also too proud for help. That person also has a problem that is rooted in pride. But this is Paul's big point in this text. At the foot of the cross, the ground is level. At the foot of the cross, the ground is level. Take a look at verse 10. None is righteous. No, not one. It's not that some do more good than others, and some do more bad than others, the point is, no one is righteous. No one is without blame. Now, this is not because we all make mistakes. You know, you ever heard that kind of line? We always throw that around. We all make mistakes, some more than others. Or, you know, sometimes we might think that being under sin is like this. We occasionally commit sins, plural. We commit sins, plural. But Paul says in verse 9, we are all under sin, singular. We are all under sin. There's a fundamental difference here. If a person considers sins to be just like a mistake, then you see it as just kind of some unexplained computer glitch. Now, I hate computer glitches. I had this thing happening to me last year on my laptop where a few times a week it would make this noise, dun dun and the screen would minimise. And then three seconds later, it would go dun-dun, and it would go back to normal. And it would do that, like, just constantly. And so I'd try every kind of technical ability that I have, which is, like, shift the angle of the laptop, um, <laughs> leave it kind of on the desk and don't touch it, step back from it, um, reboot it and start again. But no matter what I tried, it kept on doing it at random times. Now, a lot of people think that sin is just like a mistake or it's just like a glitch and they have no idea why it happens. But Paul says, no, we are under the power of sin. We are under the power of sin, singular. Now, Paul puts sin in a totally different category from mere mistakes or a glitch. We are, as people, as humans, addicted to doing the wrong thing. It's not a mistake. It's actually part of the human will the human desire and decision to do the wrong thing. In Colossians 3, Paul describes it as being the sons of disobedience. It's like disobedience is your dad, and you are the child of disobedience. It's in your nature, and that's why sin is not just mistakes. It's a power. It's a power that actually separates you from God. And therefore, far from uh, just being about learning from your mistakes 
for next time, which is actually a good thing to do, sin is in the category of spiritual life and death. So more than learning from your mistakes, your mistakes, you need saving. If it's a matter of life and death, you don't just need to learn from your mistakes, you actually need a complete salvation. You need saving. Now, Paul uses some examples from the people of old, from the Old Testament, to describe this power. And this is particularly describing the Gentiles. Look there in, uh, uh, it says there in, uh, what is it, verse 12, all have turned aside. All have turned aside. Now, this is describing, uh, you imagine a soldier with an army. And they've got the power of this army, and the army comes under threat. And what is being described here, this phrase here in the Hebrew, is like a soldier, when the heat comes on, turning from his army and running the other way. Basically, you have here a deserter. And that's what God is saying uh, humanity has done to him. They have been uh, connected with him and part of him, but what they have done is like a soldier who deserts. They have turned, and they have run the other way. All have turned aside, he says. They've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Now, notice here in verses 13 and 14, Paul uses four metaphors that describe every part of the human body that is used to form a word, to to, to speak, to actually speak. Notice here. The throat is an open grave. They use their tongues. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Every part of the human body that is used to speak. Why does Paul do that? The reason is, is because the words that we speak reveal the state of our hearts. The words that we speak reveal the state of our hearts. And so the throat, he says, has the stench of death about it. Our hearts have the stench of death about it because we are under sin's power. The the tongue... It is used to deceive people, to not tell the truth. The lips, the carelessness of our words, and the mouth, the end result of that, the cruelty towards other, others, the cruelty of our words. He, he uses this to, de, to describe how our words reveal the state of our hearts. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks, it says in God's word. This is the kind of indictment on humanity. We think, man, our words aren't they don't really matter that much. Our words, we say them and they drift away with the wind. But no, the words are much more powerful than that and they reveal the fact that we are guilty before God. Not only that, it says that their feet are swift to shed blood. This describes the violence of our time. You think about the violence even domestically, domestic violence in our world. In Australia, the scourge of Australia at the moment is domestic violence. Uh, the wars that are taking place in our world, the anger, the fury that simmers in people's hearts. This is the violence of our time. And in verse 18, Paul sums up the root of all this because there's no fear of God in their eyes. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Paul is saying that people have chosen to willfully sin throughout all human history because they feel no need to respect God, no need to fear him, no need to have regard for him, too proud to be dependent. Now we look at that description, we think, come on, like I know me, I'm not actually that bad. We, we do take that position, I'm not actually that bad. My philosophy on life is to live and let live. You know, I, I leave people alone, uh, you know, I do good so that good will come to me. But this is Paul's point. This is an indictment not only on the Gentiles who had every reason to understand what is being described here because this is how they lived. But Paul continues his thesis, which is to include the Jews. Look in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, now the law there is describing the the Old Testament passages that have just been read out because the law was sometimes used to describe the whole of the Old Testament canon. And so whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Now, that second part of it is describing more specifically the law that the Jews were under, the Mosaic law. They were under the Mosaic law. And so he includes the Jews inside the scope of sin, inside the scope of accountability. And he, and he, and he kind of, you know, um, 
puts an exclamation mark on it here saying, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. And so Paul is saying here, Jews, people who think that you're better than you really are, have an accurate view of yourself. At the foot of the cross, the ground is level. Now, it's interesting that Paul uses the mouth metaphor. He continues on. Notice that. Every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be accountable to God. What does that mean? Well, if the mouth reveals the true state of the heart, then every heart is charged with the guilty verdict, and there is nothing that you can say to defend yourself. Imagine you're in the court of law, you've done the wrong thing, the jury says you're guilty, the judge hands you down your sentence, what can you say after that? What excuse can you give? What, what words can you say back after that moment? Your mouth is stopped. You've stopped talking. You're stunned with the reality of your situation. You stop making excuses. You stop fighting with God. And, you know, it really occurred to me this week as I read that description, and particularly that metaphor, that for a person to know their need of God, they need spiritual silence. They need to get to a place where the guilty verdict has been handed down on your heart and life and you know it and you stop arguing with it and you stop actually coming back with excuses and you stop actually saying, I'm not that bad. You know, other people are worse than me, but you actually have no words left. Your pride will no longer has anything else to say. You see, to come to God, all you need is need, but it's much harder than you think. Because pride has to be defeated to the point of a stunned silence where your mouth is stopped and you realise your need. You have nothing more to say. I wonder this morning, do you recognise your need of God? That your sin is not just a glitch, it's not just mistakes, but you are under its power if you have not believed. To come to God, all you need is that need, is to recognise that need. And if you know that in your heart today, then to get off the broad road that leads to destruction and enter by the narrow gate that leads to life, then all you must have is nothing. All you must have is nothing. And the reason that I add this to this message is for the many times that I've sat in my office with people who have gone through trial and difficulty and hardship in their life, And they've actually uh, got to the point where they've recognised their need, but then this becomes the problem. There's always something. There's always something in the way. There's always something that they're not willing to give up. There's always something that they believe about themselves which they believe commends themselves to God. But the truth of the gospel is that all you need is need and all you must have is nothing. You know, having nothing is much harder than you think. You know, just think about walking through the security scan at an airport. I mean, it must be one of the simplest things to do. All you have to have is nothing on you. But I have to tell you how often with my stuff in my hands, my baggage in my hands, my mind in other places, I can't seem to walk through with nothing. My My metal belt buckle is still on. I've left something in my pocket that I forgot about. I'm holding a bottle of water that I didn't realize I was holding. Having nothing is much harder than you think. Well, look in verse 20. Paul says this, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Now, works of the law here simply means this, things that are done in obedience to the law. Things that are done in obedience to the law. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing to obey the laws of God. And it has universal implication. Nothing a person does, whatever the object of obedience or the motivation for that obedience, can bring a person into favour with God. No one is capable of doing anything to gain acceptance with God. And so what is the purpose of God's law? What purpose does it serve? Well, Paul says that through the law comes knowledge of sin. Now, God, we know in the Old Testament, gave Moses the Ten Commandments, the giving of the written law. And when humanity, when the Jews received that, 
came a knowledge. And the knowledge was the demand of God. The people were presented with the demand of God. This is his demand from his heart given to the people to show him who he really is. And coming to know God is this, that in our constant failure to attain the goal of that demand, we recognise in that process that we're sinners. That's what, it, that's what you actually have to come to know first, that we are sinners. That's what the law does. It reveals an understanding that you are under sin. The law of God makes us realise that there's nothing that we can do to earn God's favour. Now, here's the thing. Most Christians are living with the 99.99% split. You believe that 99.99% of salvation is grace and Christ, but 0.01% is because of you. In fact, perhaps your percentage on this side is actually a little bit higher, particularly at certain times. Now, you might think, no, I don't. I, 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 I don't think about God that way. I think that it's all about grace, and every Sunday we hear that it's all about grace. And so I don't believe that at all, but we do. The big test of this is when we pray, and we ask God, and he doesn't give us what we want, and we get mad. Or we think in our minds all the things that we could have done wrong in our life, but we didn't, God, because I'm a Christian. And so don't I deserve more now because of the life that I've lived and the way that I'm living? Or maybe like Fabs alerted us to this morning with the prodigal son, we are like the older brother in the story, where the young prodigal son returns home after living his life of delinquency. His father wraps his arms around him and receives him back, and the older brother's standing there thinking, what the heck? I've lived this perfect life. I didn't leave the farm. I worked here with my father. I, I, I worked the land. I did everything I was supposed to do, and now he's Receive, receiving the robe. He receives the ring on his finger. He receives the feast. How is that fair? And, and we often find ourselves living in that way, and that's moralistic thinking. I work for God, and therefore he works for me. And, and it's so difficult to have nothing, because it's so hard for to, to believe that there's not something about us that we have brought to the table that we could bring. Lord, I haven't sinned in this way for ages. I haven't seen this way in ages. Now could you grant me this thing that I want? And what it reveals is a relationship with God where we think we've deserved it and we live this way. But the truth is, Paul's saying here, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. There's nothing you can hold in your hands that will justify you before God. It's 100% grace. 100% grace. And you know what? This truth, as a Christian, it should devastate you again. It should actually make you get to the point where you realise, this is how flawed I really am. There is nothing about me that commends me to God. It should devastate you all over again, just how far short of the glory of God you really are. But then it should make you sing because God truly is a God of mercy. He truly is a God of 100% grace over your life. And, and you know what? That changes everything about us. There's a pastor who tells a story about how he was trying to explain this to a young girl, and she responded with this. It's scary. If you're saved by works, there's a limit to what God can ask of you. You're like a taxpayer, you've paid your dues and he can ask certain things of you, but not anything. But if I'm really saved by grace because of what Jesus has done, there's no limit to what he can ask of me and my obedience would have to be unconditional. God doesn't owe us anything. God has already given us everything, 100% grace. There's a story in the Old Testament before Christ even came to earth that demonstrates this so clearly. Maybe it's one you're not too familiar with. But God, he goes to the prophet Hosea and he says, Hosea, I want you to marry this woman called Gomer. 
And because God is God and Hosea is a faithful prophet, he says, okay, I will go and I'll marry this woman, Gomer. But not long after, Homer realises, Hosea, <laughs> it's Homer, it's the Simpsons. <laughs> Hosea realises that Goma isn't exactly the ideal wife. She's unfaithful to him with other men. In fact, she starts having children and Hosea realises that they aren't his kids. And he actually calls one of his kids, not mine. And you can imagine how hurt and confused Hosea is, especially as her unfaithfulness gets worse and worse and she eventually just gets up and she leaves. And she goes from one man to another man and then to another and finally the last man sells her into slavery. It's like all her unfaithfulness has caught up with her finally and she deserves what she gets. And Hosea, perhaps out of confusion, just imagine yourself in that position, turns to God and says, why did you ask me to marry this faithless woman? And in a nutshell, God says to Hosea, so that you know a little bit about my relationship to you and the people of Israel. Now you truly know what it's like to be me, to be cheated on over and over and over and over again and despised. Now here's what I want you to do, Hosea. I want you to go to the place that she's being sold, where all the men are standing around looking at her naked, as she stands there in the marketplace being sold, and they're all working out how much she's worth, how much she'd be worth to, to buy. And I want you to purchase her. I want you to take her back. And then you'll truly know what it's like to be me. Now just imagine Goma, this woman, She's naked, she's being bid on, she's lost her freedom. Right there, she's under no illusion right there how much need she's in. And, and the men, they start bidding on her and they start calling out figures. And then all of a sudden she hears a voice that's familiar. And she looks up and there is the husband that she's cheated on over and over and over and over again. And she knows right there that she doesn't deserve a thing from him. There's nothing she could do to make it right. But her husband, Hosea, ensures that he wins the bid at a very high price. And he walks up to her, instead of hissing, instead of snarling, he takes off his cloak and he covers her nakedness and he says, now you come home with me and be my wife. You see, all this woman needed was need. And all she had was nothing. And that was enough to be purchased by her husband. Think about it, how foolish it would have been for her to have been stripped naked in front of all these people about to be sold and yet in pride proclaim, I'm fine. Or how foolish to stand in front of her husband and say, he purchased me because I deserved it. She recognised her need she knew she had nothing to give. And this is just a shadow of what God has done for you. Hosea had to go from one town to another to purchase his wife with money, a woman who had crushed him and ruined his life. But God is saying, I came from heaven to earth. My son, I sent my son from heaven to earth. I had to give up my son. There he suffered and he died and he paid the penalty for your sin. I was stripped naked on the cross so I could clothe you and cover you in righteousness. Now you come home with me. And so how do you come to know God? How do you enter through the narrow gate? You say in faith this, Lord, empty-handed I come and I express my need of you. And that's what faith is where you come to a place where you realise I have nothing to commend myself. I have absolute need. That's what faith is.